I own a lot of books. I have them currently spread out over several bookshelves at work and at home. Whenever I move, they always add so much to the cost of the move because of their weight. My wife also loves books, and this past year we were able to have this beautiful bookcase built to house about two-thirds of our collection. With all these books, the most common question I'm asked when someone encounters my book collection is, have you read all of these? And the answer is no. I probably read about three quarters of them, but the rest of them are things I'm going to read someday in the future, maybe when I'm retired, or that I use them mainly for reference or some other purpose. Now, I have read the majority of them, and among these, there are some favorites, some things that really stand out. And I want to talk to you about them today in this video. I'm going to tell you about 10 books that I really very much enjoyed. I have some sort of connection to, and I've liked them so much that I've read them more than once. Now, they're not necessarily the world's greatest literature. They're not the ones that all the critics liked, but they had something in them that I related to, I had a connection to, and that's why I really want to talk about it here today. Now, my name is Eric Vanman, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you about 10 of my favorites. When my son was between the ages of about five to about seven, I would read to him every night, as my wife did as well. But the chosen books that I had to read during this time was I would always read to him from the Harry Potter books. Yes, I read every single word of all seven volumes aloud to my son at bedtime between the ages of five and seven. It was great. I enjoyed every one of those books. Well, maybe book four, you know, which one was that? The Goblet of Fire? That one was really way too long, a little too wordy, a little too boring. I had to think at the time that maybe J.K. Rowling was given free reign to need an editor anymore or something, but that was the one book where I started to doubt her talents. But by the time I got to the seventh volume, when I got to The Deathly Hollows, I have to say this was the, my favorite of all seven books. And mainly because it was such a great payoff for the entire series. I had gone through all of these books and um, was really quite attached to all of the characters. Of course, I'm not about to give away any spoilers here, but uh, like learning about Snape's true story, all of this stuff was just so amazing. And um, those final battle scenes that they had in the book, oh my gosh, I just really love these Harry Potter books, especially book seven. Now the next two books are going to be nods to Australian writers. And the first one is a very famous writer here in Australia, and maybe you've heard of him too. His name is Tim Wynn. This is probably his most famous novel, Cloud Street, that was published in 1991. It takes place in um, Perth, Australia, and it's about two families that share a house and you follow all of their adventures for about 20 years. Uh, the families are the lambs and the pickles, and they experience all sorts of obstacles and tragedies, and they also have relationships among the families. It's really an amazing book. It covers a lot of Australian themes and cultural myths, things like Australia's idea of mateship, and also, you know, Australia being the lucky country. All of these things are dealt with in this epic novel. It's an absolutely riveting read and one that I hope to read again soon. This is the only real young adult book I have on my list, although I guess the Harry Potter books would qualify there, but it's a bit different from that. Um, it focuses on Julie and Ty, who've been friends for years and fall in love in high school, but one of them develops a serious illness. This book was a finalist in 2012 for Australia's Young Adult Fiction Award, but it came out around the same time as The Fault in Our Stars, which had a similar premise and attracted probably much more attention. I much prefer this novel, as Davidson really deftly portrays the two teens in, a, in the heart of the book so perfectly, so detailed. I really got caught up in their story, and I remember I had tears in my eyes for quite like an hour after I had finished this book. It was really that moving. And that doesn't happen to me very often when I read fiction. So anyway, highly recommend Jessica Davidson's Everything Left Unsaid. The fourth book I have on my list is Possession by A.S. Byatt. When I met my wife, one of the first things I learned about her was that this was her favorite book as it was mine. So we instantly bonded over it and talked many hours about this book that we love so much. Sometime shortly after that, a disappointing adaptation of the novel came out starring Gwyneth Paltrow, which I could only stomach once, but 
I have read the novel, I think, three times since it was published in 1990. What's so great about it? Well, it has a story within a story. Two modern day academics, Roland Mitchell and Maude Bailey, are academic experts about their two favorite poets, Randolph Henry Ashe and Christabel Lamott, who lived 100 years before them. And by the way, those are fictional poets, in case you were wondering. Roland and Maude meet when they discover a previously unknown connection between their two favorite poets. They soon work together to unveil the romantic relationship between Henry Ashe and Christabel Lamott, and they fall in love themselves. Byatt's storytelling goes back and forth between the present and Randolph and Christabel's time period, complete with poems that were supposedly written by the two. There's some adventure, there's some academic competition in the present, and lots of romance. I think it might be my most favorite book, but it kind of depends on my mood. Right now, my wife is rereading it again. The fifth book I have on my list is Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett. And this is a really long book. This is like over a thousand pages, okay? So keep that in mind. When I first went to Europe in 1990, one of the things that I instantly started doing was visiting cathedrals everywhere. I was talking to the wife of a professor I was meeting at that time, and she learned of my love of cathedrals and then recommended this book by Follett, uh, which had been published the year before in 1989. Like I said, it's over a thousand pages long, and it tells the story of the building of a cathedral in the fictional town of Kingsbridge, England. It takes place in the early 1100s, and the main protagonist is Tom Builder, a mason who ends up leading the construction of the cathedral over the next decades. Along the way, there are stories involving the local sheriff, the king, priests, and lots of corruption, romance, and death. When people of this time period built a cathedral, they knew that they might not be alive when it was completed because it took so long, yet they were so committed to it and the town itself in this book grows along with the building of the cathedral. I love this book and I've read it twice. Follett went on to write other books in the Kingsbridge series, including World Without End in 2007, which is set 150 years later, and A Column of Fire in 2017 set in Elizabethan England, each having the cathedral play a central role in the novel. Follett has even written a prequel that's set in 997 AD in 2020, but I haven't read that one yet, so I don't know too much about it. Now the next book on my list became sort of a surprise favorite. I'd heard about it from several people and I didn't really know much about it though. I kind of went just based on the fact that everybody was talking a lot about it and I didn't know anything about the author beforehand. I've since read a couple of her other novels. Anyway, that book is this one, Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. And this book, is really an interesting format because what it is, it's supposed to be a sort of fictional oral history about a band that never existed. It's a band that supposedly had its peak in, in the 1970s, releasing an album called Aurora. They went on tour. They were really big. They were like basically like Fleetwood Mac in the 1970s. And so the book is a compilation of interviews with all the different people that were in the band, associated with the band, and so on, including Daisy Jones, who is uh, somebody who joins this band briefly for this period of this um, album and the time of the tour. Anyway, the book is presented, like I said, as oral histories. And so what's interesting is that every time there's an event that occurs in the book, you get to hear it from different perspectives. So it might be only a couple sentences that say, oh, this is what happens when they first met, or this is what happened, and this is what happened. So you get to see each different person recalling what happened. And it, it does a really, that format really works here, and it helps you feel like this is real. It makes you really believe that this band existed. And there's even like lyrics to their album that Taylor Jenkins Reid has written that appear at the end of the book. So you really, if you didn't know better, you might think this is actually a real oral history of an actual band. There's just so much drama, so much great storytelling, so much really good character development. When you get to the very end of the book, it's such a satisfying ending. One of the most satisfying endings of a book I've ever had. I liked this book so much when I got done reading it that I went out and found a first edition signed copy of it, if you can see here, um, because I liked it so much and I wanted to cherish it forever. So it's definitely a book I'll be rereading again and again. And I'll just mention, by the way, that uh, Amazon Prime 
has a mini-series version of this. I think it was produced by Reese Witherspoon um, that you can find now on Amazon Prime. And if you watch it and don't read the book, keep in mind that so much gets lost when you go from book to screen. Um, I think that the book is better, although I did enjoy watching the um, Amazon Prime mini-series, but I think the book is just even that much better. So consider going and reading the actual book, Daisy Jones and the Six. Number seven is Miles From Nowhere by Barbara Savage. And if you look for this book now, it actually appears in a reprinted version with a new forward, so it won't look like this. But this is the original version of the book as it was published back in 1983. I remember they actually coming across this book in the bookstore. I was at the University of Iowa at the time. I was at college and I just walked into a bookstore and found this. And because I'm an armchair traveler, who really likes reading books about travel and of course watching films and YouTube videos about travel. This book was captivating because it tells you the story about Barbara and Larry Savage who bicycle trip around the world. They just sort of decide to give up their regular jobs, sell everything, put all their money into this trip and they start riding on bicycles. Now they didn't even really have that much preparation when they did it. I think if I remember right they didn't even really know properly what to be eating. They weren't eating very healthily. And they just start bicycling up the coast of California. And it then goes on for the next two years and 25 countries later where they've been all around the world on their bikes. And it's just such an amazing adventure. It's told in this very first-hand account. Um, it's really well written. You don't need to be watching a YouTube video to see it. That's probably what would happen today. If Barbara Savage was alive and taking this trip today, she probably would have recorded the whole thing on a YouTube channel. But her writing is so great, you don't really need the video. You don't need many pictures, although there are some pictures that appear here in this book. So uh, I hope you look for it and try to find it in, a, in its reprinted format. And I'll list it, the copy that I found um, in the description below. Now the next book that I have is something that I really read as an audiobook a couple years ago, and it's called Educated by Tara Westover. I still think about this book occasionally and will probably pick up a hard copy to read again. Educated is a memoir about a girl who grew up in a remote survivalist type family in Idaho. Tara and her siblings were homeschooled and basically disconnected from most of modern life because of her parents' beliefs and suspicions, or I should say paranoias, about doctors and hospitals, public schools, and the federal government. Despite all of those obstacles and some physical abuse that she faces from her family members, um, she managed to find a way to get to college on a scholarship and get away from all of this. And she goes off to college, does really well, is an excellent student. And after she finishes her undergraduate degree, she goes off to Cambridge and completes advanced graduate degrees in history. And it's just a, such an amazing story. It's told in such a very nicely written style. I mean, that on top of it being an inspiring story, I just have to recommend it to you. It's really, really that good. So look for it, Educated by Tara Westover. Number nine is Hall's Dictionary of Subjects and Symbols in Art, written by James Hall back in 1974. Now, this is an 80s version of the book. I think it's still in print. It's, uh, it's sort of like a, a, a reference book that people keep reissuing, or whoever the publisher is keeps reissuing it. This is my version I bought around 1990. Prior to my first trip to Europe, a friend told, told me that I needed to buy this book um, and use it as a guidebook anytime I went into a museum or a gallery. And I did that, and I have since taken this book with me almost every time I've ever been to a museum or a gallery since then. And the reason for this is that long ago when paintings were made, they were originally done in the 1300s, 1200s, 1400s, whatever, for people who were illiterate. They wouldn't have read texts, they wouldn't have been able to read or write. So therefore, they would have looked at these paintings as very rich stories and they would have understood a lot of the symbolism in there so that they could understand the story. And in our modern eyes, we don't really know what those stories are anymore. We don't know who the characters are in the paintings or what all the symbols mean. And this book helps you 
understand those. So what you can do is like if you're looking at a painting that has a couple goats and Jesus in it, you might look up goats and find out what goats represent and how they might fit in with the story of Jesus. Or um, it could be anything. It could be about Greek mythology and understand who the different Greek gods are that are in the painting and what they're holding and what their symbols are. Um, it's sort of like a universal decoder for all those European paintings that were painted in centuries before, ago. I, I have never taken a course in art history, so I don't even know if they hold this book in any high regard, but I found it really useful for somebody who, you know, is naive about art and paintings and understanding all the history of it. Now my last book is actually a set in a trilogy, okay? You can see it here. And it's called the Griffin and Sabina Trilogy. And I'm just gonna pop out the first book here. The very first book in this trilogy was called Griffin and Sabina, An Extraordinary Correspondence, all right? And it was published in 1991. And the very first one, a friend of mine gave this to me as a birthday gift, and I just instantly loved it. And then the next two years, there were two more books that came, and that's what makes up this trilogy. The basic plot is that Griffin is an artist living in London who makes postcards for a living. And one day, he receives a really cryptic postcard from Sabina, a woman he's never met. And then they soon start to correspond, sending letters and postcards back and forth to each other. But they never actually meet in this book. So what's cool about this book, as you can see, is that they have reprints of these different postcards on here. It's, they're very beautiful. Um, you can tell that the postcards would have been individually made by the um, by either Griffin or Sabina. And there's even letters that you can pull out of envelopes and you can read the letter. And it's as if you actually have the real letter that Sabina or Griffin has sent to the other person. And so it's this really nice interactive kind of book. Um, and it's made by this artist who, uh, Bant Bantock, and Nick Bantock was obviously a very fine artist who also is a great storyteller. He's made some other books in this series. I think there's another couple trilogies that came out after this. Um, anyway, I got lost in their stories. I just thought these three books were the most fantastic. They're just, they're sort of mysterious. They don't fully tell you all of the details. You get to fill in the gaps. But it's sort of like you just came upon a treasure chest of correspondence between two people and you had to kind of figure it all out. And that's what these books are like. So they've always been very special to me and I lost the original books that I had somewhere over the years. So I just recently found these online as a nice set container box. Um, they're kind of expensive. I think this is around $200 when I ordered it online in Australian dollars, uh, but maybe you can find it cheaper at a used bookstore or something. So there are my 10 favorite books of all time. Now I have other favorites and I'm thinking about in future videos giving you like my 10 favorite psychology books or my 10 favorite biographies. If you want to get those, you might want to go ahead and subscribe then to this channel and hit the notification button there so you'll hear about those videos when they come out. I'm also curious about what your favorite books are. So maybe you want to leave a comment in the comments below about what your favorite books are and it'd be really interesting to see what other people are reading and maybe some of them are the same books I have on my list. Until next time, stay curious. Bye.